Tonight, take a text from Luke chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading with the first verse. And I will read after these scriptures, two other scriptures. They will be in Isaiah 59, 16, and the other was one is 1 Timothy 3.16. You don't have to turn to those two, but you might want to make a reference of it. Amen. And then I'm going to preach tonight from the first chapter, beginning with verse 21 of Matthew. Now that lets you know a little bit, not for pride, but so I don't have to read it, okay? One of the greatest, well, I'm going to back that up. The greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told. Amen. Chapter 2 of Luke, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be fulfilled, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the glory of the Lord shone round about them. What happened? An angel said unto them, Fear not! Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Glory to God. How many thank God for Bethlehem? Yes. Amen. Amen. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now listen carefully. 1 Timothy 3.16 Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, Believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Carefully now listen. Isaiah 59, 16. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. Therefore, his arm, referring to God, his arm brought salvation unto him. God became a man. Creator came to redeem creation. Eternal Spirit came and tabernacled in the womb of the Virgin Mary. God came down and walked amidst men. His arm brought salvation unto him. My text tonight, when God rolled up his sleeve, 
In Jesus' name. You may Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory. Here is a young man born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. And then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book, he never owned a home, he never went to college, he never had a family. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. While still a young man, the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was condemned to die on a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property that he owned on earth. And that was his cloak. <laughs> when he was dead, he was laid in the bald grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen wide centuries have come and gone. And tonight, he's the central figure of the human race. And the leader of its column of progress. I am far within my mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, and all the navies that ever sailed, and all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together, have not affected the life of man upon this earth as has that one solitary life. Hallelujah. Thank God for Bethlehem. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God. You see, it was God with us at Bethlehem. It was God for us at Calvary. But it's God in us at Pentecost. And you see, we're Christ 10,000 times born in Bethlehem's manger. And yet not once in my heart, my case would be forlorn. But oh, God, I appreciate you tonight. God was manifest in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Verse 2, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. Reading from 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. First John 4 verse 2. Hereby perceive ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that professes that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Hallelujah. Oh, he pushed back the stars and came to a stable in Bethlehem. Yes, yes, yes. He who had the angelic hails of heaven came down to the murderous nails of men. My God, the creator of all eternity, came down to walk amidst people like you and like me. Why was it preacher? Why was it saint? The Bible said he looked and saw there was no man. You see, as the sound said, he searched heaven and there was none that could be found worthy. God had to become a man. God had to walk as a man, talk as a man, live as a man, feel as a man, be tempted as a man, and die as a man on a cross. And yet that flesh as a man had to be pure, had to be holy. Never once could it have sinned. Never once could it have committed an iniquity or it would have all been over. The ball game would have been finished. Oh, my God came down and tabernacled himself in the womb of Mary and was born of a woman and walked amidst the sons of men. I tell you, God looked around and saw there was nobody. And God said, I'll take care of it myself. I won't send an angel for an angel can't do what I'm going to do. I won't dispatch a cherubim or a seraphim. God said, I'll 
I'll go down. I'll be a man. I'll take on flesh. So God rubbed his sleeves. And God said, I'll do the job. Aren't you glad for it tonight? Let, let, let me reinforce this thought. Listen carefully. Hebrews 2 verse 14 through verse 18. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Carefully now listen. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. That was not an angel born of the Virgin Mary. That was not an angel that was spat upon and they slapped his face white like a hawthorn blossom. That was not an angel that they put a crown of thorns on his brow that ripped it like jackals to the face of a captive lion. That was not an angel that they drove nails in his hands and nails in his feet and pierced his side and forthwith came blood and water. No! That was the eternal spirit that was God in the form of a man, in the guise of a man. Oh, God, I appreciate salvation's plan. God did not die. The flesh he picked up died. The man died. The flesh died. He got from Mary, not God. The spirit in him that was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself never did die. There never was a time when God wasn't. Never will be a time when God isn't. He always has and always will be. But he took on flesh. He made bare his arm. He rolled up his sleeve, so to speak, and said, I'll whip the devil. I'll conquer sin on Calvary. I'll give victory to the human race. Oh, hallelujah. Everybody please that said, amen. amen. For verily took not on him the nature of angels, but he right. took on him the seed of Abraham. Right. Wherefore, in all points, listen to this, it behooved him to be made in to his brethren. Oh, don't you, don't, don't you feel the, 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 what this bespeaks? It bespeaks kinship. It bespeaks kinship. He's my brother. My brother died for me. My brother bled for me. My brother that had the same kind of flesh I've got that feels and sees and heard and talked that was a man who slept, who ate, who, who was weary, who got thirsty, who knew he had to pray. My brother, my brother died for me. Hallelujah. Made like unto his brethren. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That he might in all points be tempted like as we are yet without sin. For in that he himself hath been tempted. Amen. He is able to succor. That means help or aid in them that are tempted. You won't walk a lonesome mile but what Jesus hadn't already been there. You won't feel a pain or a heartache for what he hasn't felt. And there's no sin but what he knows how to conquer. God became a man. He took on a heart and a set of lungs. He took on eyes and ears. He felt as a man, walked as a man. God said, I'll whip the devil. He rolled up his sleeves and he did it. He did it. He did it. He did it. Oh, I appreciate him, don't you? Hallelujah. When God rolled up his sleeves, traversed the stars and came to a stable, the God that never knew an ounce of pain came to feel pain. The God that didn't know what it was to cry came and as a man cried, as a man suffered. Oh God, the holy, virtuous, amen, unblameable, unblameless, amen, hallelujah, God of heaven, died as a man on the cross, prayed as a man in the garden. Oh, I thank you, Jesus. You can track him by the blotches of blood in Gethsemane's hallowed prayer room. You can track him, my brother, up Golgotha's lonely, windswept brow. You can track him. That's the God of heaven. That's the seawalker, the moon maker. That's the creator in the guise of a man walking up Calvary's lonely hill to die for you and to die for me. I tell you, I appreciate it tonight. On with the story. Matthew 1. Let's begin verse 18, rather. 
Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now if you're a Trinity, you've got problems. Because Luke 135, the angel told Mary, the power of the high shall come up on thee. Amen. Amen. That which is conceived in you is of the Holy Ghost. How could the third person conceive the second person and yet the second person be called the Son of God or the first person? The Holy Ghost was the Father of Jesus Christ. You can't have two fathers. Malachi 2 can said, Have not we all one Father? Had not one God created us? Amen. Amen. The Holy Ghost performed the miracle act of fraternity in the womb of Jesus, a womb of Mary, and Jesus was born. Right. Hallelujah. Right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was his spouse of Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, just man. and not willing that hey, his wife, you know, shouldn't be a public example, uh -huh. he, he was minded to, to put her away privately. Uh -huh. Amen? Uh -huh. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. Hallelujah. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. I'm here to tell you four square. I believe the Bible teaches the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. He wasn't born of just a young woman. He was born of a stainless virgin, armed only with innocence. He was born in a stable. What is this world, my friend, but an immense stable? A stable! A filthy stable! He was born in it. And this world is nothing but an immense stable where men produce filth and then wallow in it. He was laid in a manger, the only clean place in a stable. Oh, God! Oh, God! The God of heaven came down and was born of a virgin in a, in a stable and laid in a manger. This was all a fulfillment of prophecy. It was in the mind and program of God. There wasn't an angel that was worthy. There wasn't a celestial being that could qualify. There wasn't a man that had ever lived from Adam on down through the race of humanity that could qualify. Sin had infiltrated. Sin had contaminated. Sin had condemned. None of us was worthy. The devil could find fault with every one of us. But oh, God came down. God took on the flesh. God took on the flesh. And he lived above sin. Hallelujah! Let me quickly give you a few foundation scriptures. Way back in the Garden of Eden, when God pronounced judgment on the woman and on the serpent and Adam. Notice what he said in particular between the woman and the serpent. Genesis 3.15, God's talking. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Talking to the woman and the serpent. Between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Talking about the seed of the woman was going to bruise the head of the serpent. And thou shalt bruise his heel. The seed of the serpent was going to bruise the heel. Sure, he was bruised on Calvary. Sure, he was wounded. Sure, he hurt. Sure, he had heartache and headache and, and soul ache. Sure, he knew how to cry. Sure, he was forsaken by friends. Sure, he was, my friend, betrayed by his own familiar friend. But that same seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, who was God, he bruised the head of the serpent. Woo! Calvary! He bruised his head. Brother, you can be wounded, but brother, you can go on. But if your head's bruised, if your head's smashed, you've got no victory coming. And God said the seed of the woman was going to bruise the head of the serpent. Calvary! Victory was won! Thank you, Jesus! Genesis 49, 10. Jacob prophesied, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Oh God. Notice the great man of God, before he left this earth, he didn't qualify. No, he didn't. Yet he prophesied of one that would come. Yeah. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, like unto me. Uh -huh. Unto him ye shall hearken. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Amen. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
Notice the Son was going to be called the Everlasting Father. The marginal reading says Father of Eternity. How could the Son be the Father? Well, Jesus said, John 14, 9, when you see me, you've seen the Father. Amen. John 10, 30, I am a Father of one. First John 2, 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and know all things. Revelation 1, 8, I'm Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. The first and the last, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. That's Jesus doing all that talking. Hallelujah. So, the everlasting Father of Isaiah 9 and 6 was the Son born of Mary in Matthew 1, 21. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Hallelujah. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Hallelujah. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. No upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice. From his forth even forever, the seal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Uh-huh. Isaiah 11, 1. Pick up one more verse of scripture. The prophecy said, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David, as you know. And here the prophecy was out of David's lineage. There was come a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch was going to grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And these seven demonstrations right here coincide with the seven spirits of God. All seven manifestations of God's Spirit was resident upon Jesus' ministry. He demonstrated every one of them. He was a counselor of the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He was all of that. And the Spirit of wisdom and knowledge, the Spirit of counsel and understanding, the Spirit of might and knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. It was all on him, in him, around him. He was God. Verse number 10 of Isaiah 11. The Bible said, And in that day there shall be a root of David which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but the rest of Isaiah 28, 11, we're standing lips and the tongue, we speak to those people, and we say, this is the rest. The rest is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, my brother, is no more and nothing less than Jesus Christ. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. John 14, 18. I don't know why I'm hitting some of this, but uh, Colossians 1, 27, Christ in you. Galatians 4, verse 6, uh, Spirit of the Son into our hearts. Galatians 2, 20, Christ liveth in me. 2 Corinthians up. Uh, 13, and five. Jesus Christ is in you. Uh, Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ be dwell in your hearts by faith. And on and on. You see, Jesus is the Father, Isaiah 9, 6. He's the Son, Matthew 1, 21. And He's the Holy Ghost. Amen. John 14, 18. Hallelujah! In John 14, 20, let me just give you another. Jesus said, At that day ye shall know that I am my, in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! So this rod was going to come out of the stem of Jesse. This branch was going to grow out of his roots. And in that day there shall be a, a, a root of Jesse, and it shall stand for an ensign of the people. Ensign means flag or standard, something you can rally around. Like old glory, you know, the flag of our country, it's a symbol. It stands for something. Listen, Jesus stood for something. His humanity yes. was sinless. His humanity was sinless. He was guileless. He was innocence par excellence. He was absolutely, irrevocably, and irretrievably holy. One hundred percent holy. He was God in the hand of men. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He was the eternal creator, wedded to his creation. Oh, God, I thank you that you came down. I thank you that you put on flesh. Hallelujah. 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 Isaiah 32, verse 1. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man, everybody say man. man. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. I have a time to go into the multifaceted ministry of Jesus. But he was a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. He was a drink of good, cool, clear water. And everything he ever said he would be, he is, and much more. Yes, sir! The Bible said, one more now, Isaiah 28 and verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion. And Zion is always a word symbolic of God's people or God's church. Behold, I lay in Zion uh, for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. Hallelujah. And he that believeth shall not make haste. And you remember, you remember that Ephesians 2.20 said, We are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
stone. There's a foundation in Zion. There's a stone in Zion. We are built on something that is holy and pure. Our redemption is not so shaky as it stands upon the mind of men, the wisdom of man, or the philosophy of the sages. Our eternal destiny does not depend on the realm of someone's emotion. This was not hatched up in some university. But the God of glory, but the God of eternity, but the God of the angels, but the God of everlasting immortality, that God came down and walked among men, talked among men, and lived among men, thank you Jesus, and died as a man. I appreciate that again and again. Now let me hurry. Let me hurry. I don't like to hurry so fast. I tell you, I have to spit these scriptures out so fast I don't even get too much good out of myself. And I know where I'm going. You may not. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. I'm going to crank this thing back just a little bit. Okay. Micah 5 verse 2. Catch this now. 500 years before Jesus Christ was born. 500 years. It was prophesied where he was to be born. Now, you may not think that's much. It staggers my imagination. Right. What if 500 years ago someone prophesied where you was going to be born? Right. They would have to have foreknowledge and what's called omniscience or all wisdom. They would have to know everything to do that. Well, Micah 5 verse 2 said, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Doesn't that tell you something? The babe that was born in the manger was the one that flung the stars off of his fingertips. The babe that was born in the stable was the one that created the sun and the moon. The babe that was born in the stable was the one that had the angelic hails of heaven. The babe that was born was the mighty God, was the everlasting Father. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So God looked into the affairs of humanity. What a sordid mess it was. And I won't take time to build this point. Man was in a mess. Nobody could be found worthy to redeem. It took a sinless sacrifice of blood. For Leviticus 17, 11 said it's blood that makes atonement for the soul. Money couldn't buy it. Houses and education couldn't buy it. It was going to take the shedding of pure, holy, undefiled, incorruptible blood that could be shed. God said he would do it. Now let me link these scriptures together and listen a little carefully. You read in Acts 20 verse 28, it said to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. Now I'm not going to quote all these verses. I'm just going to put out the part I want and run it to again. Catch these carefully. He said to feed the church of God which he, God, had purchased with his own blood. Revelation 1 verse 5, unto him that loved us and washed us in his own blood. 1 John 3 verse 16, hereby perceive we the love of God. Amen. Because he laid down his life for us. Now how did God lay down his life for us? John 4, 24 said, God is a spirit. Jesus himself taught in Luke 24, 39, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. First Corinthians 15, 50 said, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. A spirit doesn't have flesh and blood. God did not possess flesh and blood. God did not possess mortality. God did not possess corruptible flesh and blood. God did not possess a susceptible nature to sin. God could not be tempted. He was eternal, irrevocable, the absolute, the supreme. He was the one that always was. But God declared, being there was none worthy, God the Spirit, God the eternal God, said He would take on flesh. He would take on blood. He would take on a carnal nature. He would take on mortality. He would take on corruptible flesh. He would conquer it. He would reign in it. He would, he would supremely offer it on Calvary as a sacrifice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when John, when John the Baptist, when John the Baptist, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming down the road in John 1.29, he said, Behold, behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. When God, when God rolled up his sleeves, whoa, I'm dead. 
Joseph, her husband. Let me back up just a little bit. I won't get it all. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Matthew 1, 18. And as his mother Mary was his spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she found the child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Right, right. The Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus. Say it, folks. Jesus. Oh, we maybe don't appreciate that revelation. Anytime, and I won't take but a 30 seconds to tell you this. You can read in the Old Testament. It would do you good to do a little research on this. Where anybody ever got close enough to God, they would say, tell me your name. You remember when Manoah, the Lord, appeared to Manoah and told him about Samson to be born. And, yeah. and they asked the angel, what's your name? He said, why seek a star to my name? Seeing it is secret. Yeah. Well, the, the margin says wonderful. Seeing it is wonderful. And of course, Isaiah 9, 6 says, one of his titles is, is wonderful. But it was secret. He was known by titles. Amen. He told you that. Old Testament relationship. Jehovah Adantai. Jehovah Elohei. Jehovah Elohim. Jehovah Elohika. Jehovah Elohim. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Rothika. Jehovah Rothay. And uh, Jehovah Shalem. Jehovah Swal. And so, uh, Jehovah Sabaoth. And Jehovah uh, Sidkei. On and on. We won't get into all that. But those were titles. He was known as titles. Father of Abraham. Father of Isaac. So on. But there came a day when God the Spirit took on flesh through the Virgin Mary. When God was born as a human. That is the son that was born of the woman Mary. The woman Mary. The virgin Mary. When she was born, the name that's above every name, the name that only you can be saved in, thou shalt call his name Jesus. You know what Jesus means? It literally means Jehovah becomes salvation. And that's the essence of it. God, Jehovah, the Father, the Eternal Spirit, became salvation, became the redemptive plan through the flesh. Oh, hallelujah! Everybody please that said amen! It's in the Bible. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Everybody say from. You don't read in their sins. It says from their sins. Amen. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, amen, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Everybody say Emmanuel. Emmanuel. All right, Matthew interprets it, which being interpreted is God with us. God say it together. God say it again. God That's what Jesus was. God with us. As a man, he hungered. As a man, he slept. As a man, he wearied with his journey. As a man, he got thirsty at Jacob's well. As a man, he prayed more earnestly great drops of blessed were sweat. As a man, he knew all of this. But as God, he walked on the water. As God, he healed the sick. As God, he raised the dead. As God, he fed the 5,000. As God, he melted the frozen fountains of speech in a liquid language. As God, he cleansed the leprosy. As God, he was God-man. He was divinity fused with humanity. He was God with us. 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 Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not that she had brought forth her firstborn son. Everyone said firstborn son. I think there's a reason that's in there. Jesus was the firstborn, born of a virgin. Amen. Amen. Knew her not that she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and are come to worship him. Are come to worship him. That's what I came here tonight for. I came to worship the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And everybody, these were wise men. Not necessarily three in number, 
but they were wise men who had understood these things and they saw the proverbial star in the east. This was a literal happening. This was not something in the mind because they traversed hundreds of miles without modern, amen, compasses and gyroscopes and methods in the unfamiliar terrain. Only a star to guide them. The Bible speaks of the star out of Jacob. We won't get into that. But anyhow, these, these wise men said, We have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, that word Christ means Messiah or anointed one. And what he was meaning was, where would the Messiah be born? Where would the promised seed of Abraham? Where would the one be born that's going to conquer sin and conquer uh, carnality? Where, where, where is it written in the scripture? And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet. And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Amen. And in, in the meanwhile, these wise men were walking the streets of Jerusalem saying, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? Where is he that's born king of the Jews? For we see his star in the east and are come to worship him. Oh, I hope I can awaken an appetite in your heart tonight. I hope that I can awaken a desire that you will come and say, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? Where is he that came to die for my soul? Where is he? I want to meet him. I want to have an experience with him. I want to become one of his converts. These, these, they, these wise men were saying this throughout Jerusalem. Then the Bible said, Then Herod, when he had privately, which means privately, had called the wise men, he inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. This was a lie. This was a false Hood. Amen. Herod did not want to worship. He was afraid of Jesus. Jesus was a rival. Jesus was a threat. Jesus was someone Herod thought would take off and take away his political influence. Jesus was someone Herod thought would take off and take away his political influence. Take away his ease of living. Pull out from underneath him that fancy rug he was standing on. And that, that luxurious life he was living. He looked upon Jesus as a rival. Oh, some of you tonight, if you could just get it in your minds and in your hearts. Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. He'll never take anything away from you you shouldn't have anyhow. He'll never say anything that you need to do that you shouldn't do anyhow. Jesus has come to set up housekeeping in your soul. He wants to take up residence in your heart. He wants to enthrone himself as a king in your life. Hallelujah. Don't get jealous of him. Don't get jealous of your children or of your wife or of your husband or of your kin folks when they start looking for Jesus and want to worship Jesus. Don't get a jealous spirit about you like King Herod had when he thought Jesus was a rival for the throne. Your wife's a better wife because of the Holy Ghost. Your husband's a better husband because of the Holy Ghost. Your children are better children because of the Holy Ghost. You ought to want them to serve God. You ought to want them to praise the Lord. Hallelujah! When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Oh, they followed a star. Some of you would ridicule, mock and mimic and satire and laugh and leer and poke fun and, and say all kinds of crazy things about someone that would follow a star. You're on a tangent, a wild goose chase. You're out in the north 40 and you're beside yourself and much learning's made you mad. You're goofy. You're, you're incompetent. The, the boys the white coats and the butterflies it ought to get you any time. You're beside yourself. What are you doing in your house? Following a star. Wise men risking their fortunes, their lives, and their health to follow a star. But this just wasn't any old star. This wasn't just any old happening. This wasn't just any old journey. No, sir. No, sir. And when these wise men came out of Herod's palace, and the Bible tells me that star went before them, it started moving again. Now, follow me close. It started
started moving again. Listen, I'm not going to preach you that people in other churches and other parts of the world don't have an experience with God. I don't care who you are, what color of skin you is. If you're humble, if you're sincere, and bow on me and ask God for help and for mercy and pray to the true God and the righteous God, He will help you and He will give you an experience. It may be a repentant experience. It may be an experience of some sort of a blessing. But God will. But here's the point. You've got to follow that star. When the Word of God leads you, when the Word of God leads you, just like the star led the wise men, you got to follow it. You may have to risk your life, your health, your money, your home, your family, your friends. Amen. Yeah. But you've got to follow that star. You've got to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. A lot of us. Hallelujah. That star came till it stood over where the young child was. The star led him to Jesus. The Holy Ghost is given as a teacher. It's given as a guide. I'm preaching here tonight. Yes, sir, I feel this going home. I'm preaching to somebody tonight. The Holy Ghost is given to guide you and lead you into all truth and righteousness. And if you'll let it, it'll lead you to Jesus. If you'll let it, it'll lead you to Jesus. It'll lead you to Jesus. The Bible said, and it came so over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. It perhaps had disappeared for a few days. They thought their journey was over in Jerusalem. Some of us perhaps thought our quest for salvation was over in certain areas of truth, partial truth. Maybe you've been baptized in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And you've got the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. You think, I've got it all. And then suddenly the star begins to move. And the Word of God shows you that the apostles baptized in Jesus' name. In Acts 2.38, Acts 8.16, Acts 10.48, Acts 19.5, Romans 6, 3, Colossians 2.12, and Galatians 3.27. And that star begins to show you that the name of the Father is Jesus. And the name of the Son is Jesus. And the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. And the name of Wonderful is Jesus. And the name of Everlasting Father is Jesus. And the name of the Mighty God is Jesus. And the name of the Counselor is Jesus. And the name of the Advocate is Jesus. And the name of Alpha and Omega is Jesus. And the name of the Foundation of God is Jesus. And the name of the Rose of Sharon is Jesus. And the name of the Lily of the Valleys is Jesus. And the name of the Captain of our Salvation is Jesus. And the name of all of His titles is Jesus! 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 They saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. How many of you remember when you saw the light? Hallelujah! Didn't you rejoice? Didn't you rejoice? Didn't you rejoice? Yes, I want you to notice something now. And when they were coming to the house, it wasn't the manger now, it was in a house. Several days had transpired. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child. Amen. Amen. He saw the young child with Mary's mother. And when they had opened their treasures, packed treasures hundreds of miles, when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts. Don't you dare come empty-handed to Jesus. They presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. I've often wondered why. Why gold, frankincense, and myrrh? And I believe God showed me. When those wise men opened their treasures and presented gifts, they presented unto him gold because he was a king. You give gold to a king. They presented unto him frankincense, which is an incense you offer in worship and in adoration. They give him that because he was God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then they presented him myrrh. Myrrh is an embalming ingredient. They presented him myrrh because he was born to die. And you get the picture. He was born to die. Die, die for the sin of the world. Die for the lost. Die for the hard-hearted. Die for the murderer. Die for the whoremonger. Die for the adulterer. Die for the liar. Die for the thief. Die for the drunkard. Die for the dope addict. For the midnight rider. Die, die, die. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He sent it unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. You know what a thought just dawned on me when I was thinking this over here a while back? 
I tell you, when I ran this through my mind like a transcript and I hit this verse, I almost jumped with joy. Now, you know what I felt? When those uh, wise men opened their treasures and presented the gifts, I felt God was telling me, now preacher, you go tell them pre people out there, hey man, you go tell them to, to break out the gifts, to break out the gifts, to open up the gifts. What do you mean? Well, let's give him a gift of hallelujah, a gift of glory to God, a gift of thank you, Jesus, a gift that I appreciate the plan of salvation. I appreciate the Creator would become a creation, a flesh to die on Calvary, the flesh. I appreciate God became a man. I appreciate He came all the way down through 42 generations. 42 generations from Adam until the day the babe was born. 42 generations. He came down. I say it's time to break out the gifts. I say it's time to break out the gifts. I say it's time to praise Him and to worship Him. Hallelujah! grace that brought it down to man. We sung it twice this morning. And I thought, how, how important. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, he came a long, long way. Pushed back the stars and walked across the Milky White Way. Came down to a despicable, sin-blasted planet. Was born of a virgin to die on a cross. Oh, God, you rolled up your sleeves. Oh, you came down. I appreciate it and I want you to know it. Hallelujah. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Another way. You see, after you meet Jesus, you go home another way. You can date everything in your life from the time you met Jesus. Everything become different. Oh, it's different. Oh, so different. Since the time I caught a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of Jesus, the Holy Ghost, baptized in His name, oh my God, I went home a different way. Some of you here tonight that's lost. Some of you here tonight full of sin and shame, bitterness and defeat. Some of you here tonight that don't have the love of God in your heart. If you'll come and worship Him and break out the gifts, you can go home a different way. You can go home a different way. You can go home a different man, a different woman, with a new heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. God knew Herod's heart. God knew the conniving, plotting of his ingenious mind. God knew the motive behind his, right. his, his worship so-called. God knows why we're here tonight, doesn't he? And he knows whether we mean it when we clap our hands. He knows whether we mean it when we sing amazing grace. He knows whether we mean it when we give him offerings of praise. I want us to mean every hallelujah. I want us to mean every praise the Lord. Amen! Amen. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Then Herod, when he saw, he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, yeah. and set forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he diligently inquired of the wise men. His true nature revealed itself. Oh, don't you get, don't you get seduced by the devil's thousand costumes and thousand masks. Don't let him hoodwink you. Don't let him soft soap you. Don't let him soft pedal you. Don't let him promise you money when it's only counterfeit. Don't let him promise you fire when it's nothing but painted fire for the wintry seasons of life. Don't ever let him tell you something because he's a liar. He's a liar. John 8, 44 says he's a liar and the father of it. He's a thief and the thief cometh to steal and to kill and to destroy. The devil loves company because misery loves company. Hell was never prepared for man. It was prepared for the devil and his angels and their disobedience. If you go there, you're going to have to stumble over the roadblock of Calvary. You're going to have to stumble over the roadblock of Pentecost. You're going to have to walk over the prayers of your mother and the prayers of your father and the prayers of your husband and the prayers of your wife and the prayers of your children and the prayers of this preacher and the prayers of this church and the prayers of this evangelist. We're standing here screaming and hollering, Turn back! Turn back! Turn back! Herod 
revealed himself for what he really is. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. He gave the order and they went through Bethlehem and all the coast, killing every child two years old and under. Right. Oh God, does that mean anything to you? Even with little children that young, would you like to hear a burly rap at your door? And rough hands of soldiers rush in and snatch the babe from your bosom and carry it out and dash its little head against the rocks and hurry on in the night to the next house. And the anguish of the cry as it repeats itself like undulating oceanic waves and redounds and reverberates and echoes down the streets and back alleys of Bethlehem and all the coast thereof as little innocent innocent children are killed because of the raging jealousy of a madman. Oh, the devil wants you tonight. Oh, he wants you young people. He wants you, Dad. He wants you, Mama. Don't ever buy his little game. He don't want you to go to heaven. He wants to damn and doom and desecrate and deplete and bankrupt your soul. He wants to send you into hell in torment. Oh, God, let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, the Bible said in Ramah, why? Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy, the prophet, saying, in Ramah, was there a voice heard? Amidation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Have you ever tried to comfort a mama who's lost a little baby? Have you ever walked up to the casket and put your consoling arm around her and said, now everything's going to be all right? And her heaving breast sobs with great loud wails. There's no words can save her wounded heart. There's nothing you can say. No amount of money can take a mother's love and patch it up for a baby that was snatched away from her. Oh, the awesome wail! The piercing cry throughout Bethlehem and the coast! Because of these innocent little children. Mama, daddy, parents. Oh God, get us under a burden tonight. The devil wants our young people. The devil wants to walk in and take them out of the church. Take them out of your home. Take them out of the influence of the scripture. Put them in some atheistic, unbelieving environment. Put them out there where they drink and carouse. And wear their godliness down. And take them and damn their soul. Oh God, have you ever heard a mama cry? Or a father cry, let's lost their children, lost their children, let's put up a standard, let's put up a standard, let's put up a standard. Oh God, amen. You see, the devil ran Jesus off into Egypt in exile, ran him out under the cover of darkness, chased him away. Oh, it must have been something for hell to laugh at, to think about. And then the slaughter of the innocents. But the Bible said, but when Herod was dead. See, this was all in the program of God. But when Herod was dead. See, God only has to sit back and wait. Second Peter tells me that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years is. And a thousand years is one day. Chapter 3, verse 8. You see, God has but to wait for the Herods of this world. Well, I won't take time to mention them, but there's been Herods of every age and in every society that try to reign and rule in carnality and in sin. And oh, it looks like they're going to thwart or they're going to hinder or they're going to roadblock or stymie or stumble the work of God. And it looks like they're going to freeze it in its tracks. But us and the Herods of this world are going to pass away one of these days. But when Herod was dead, behold, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead that sought the young child's life. He left Israel, Bethlehem, for Egypt as an exile, a hunted fugitive under the cloak of darkness, ran out pushed away, pursued by the devil. But when he came back, after the Herods were dead, he came back in triumph, in broad daylight. He came back in open victory. Let me tell you something tonight. When Jesus left this world on a cross, the hounds of hell bayed at his heels and said, we've got him now. We bruised his heel. The sinless Savior of men. He's goofed now. He'll never make it. He's ran out of this world. 
and the hounds of hell laughed at him, mocked at him. When Jesus died on a cross, an ignominious, inglorious defeat with a pierced side, nail-pierced hands and feet, a, a crown of thorns on his brow. Oh, God, what a sight that must have been with dirty sputum running down his cheeks. Oh, God, mocked and ridiculed and railed. The devil laughed at him. You're caught now. You're defeated now. But oh, my brother, he's coming again. He's coming again. The lonely Nazarene is coming again. He's coming on the clouds of heaven. He's coming in the clouds of glory. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. He's coming! He's coming! He's coming! Mark it down! Mark it down, you Herods that control the political empires of this world, that rule the minds of men. Jesus is coming again! He's coming again! He's coming again! They won't spit on him this time. They won't gouge his side with a spear this time. They won't slap his face this time. They won't put a crown of thorns on him this time. They won't put on the, they won't put a crown or a cross on his back this time. No! He's coming! He's coming! He's coming! My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the village where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. See, I'm not talking about the rapture. That's the coming for the saints. He'll never touch the earth at the rapture. I'm talking about at the end of the tribulation period. When he comes to ride on those white horses with the sainted dead. Whew. And he comes to fight the battle of Armageddon. He's coming, Herod. He's coming, Herod. He's coming! He's coming! He's coming! Believe that tonight? Yeah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Let's praise him for that. Oh, God. 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 Oh, came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the womb of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream. And God can speak to you in a dream. But it will never contradict the word of God. Being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee and came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, he shall be called a Nazarene. The devil didn't hinder it. The devil couldn't stop it. God rolled up his sleeves and said, I'm going to take care of the matter. Step aside angels. Step aside cherubims and seraphims. Step aside clouds. Step aside stars. Step aside Herods. Step aside Caesars. Step aside kings of this world. I'm going to come down with a plan. Hallelujah. 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 Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, lived on in the world, received up in the glory. God was. God was. Made bare his holy arm. I'm glad he rolled up his sleep. Let's praise him for it. Hallelujah! Oh, stand 
with me. <clears throat> Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the village where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Well, glory, glory. Come on, sing it! Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Loose the faithful light of his 